Hi, this is Emily Freitag, and I'm so glad to be joined today by Bill McCallum, formerly of University of Arizona and now CEO of Illustrative Mathematics, to talk about rethinking intervention and what we know to be true about what works and what we know doesn't work about accelerating student learning with a focus today on mathematics. Um, thank you so much for joining us and for having this conversation today. And as with all of them, I'd love to start with your personal story. So just tell us a little okay. bit about yourself as a learner, your own journey, and what that teaches you about learning. Well, um, I guess just thinking about mathematics learning in particular, I'll tell you that when I was a kid, I used to love to solve math puzzles. Um, my mother would drive me to the local library and I'd get out books of math puzzles. And I really always carried that. Of course, I became a research mathematician. So I guess that was a natural extension of that early interest. But I learned by working on problems and by solving puzzles, to put it in a nutshell. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one puzzle I was trying to solve that uh, it's like that really classic difficult coin weighing puzzle where you have 12 coins and one of them's either heavier or lighter than the others and you have three weighing. It's a really difficult puzzle and I was in tears trying to solve it. My mother had already solved it and she came in and asked me, this was a seminal moment in my mathematics education, not just a random story, I think. She, um, she said, do you want me to tell you the answer? And I said, no, don't tell me the answer. And so she said, okay, and she went out of the room again. So having a teacher who is willing to let you struggle, even when they see the pain of that struggle, I think is important. Mm, thank you for sharing that. I've been struck across these conversations, how much um, our own stories carry a lot of insight into our point of view. Um, so please just zoom out for us. You have um, studied and uh, written about mathematics in American education for quite some time and now developing curriculum, working with teachers. Um, what do, from your experience, what do we know to be true about what works in the job of accelerating learning for students? Um. I'm going to give you just my perspective as a mathematician and as someone who has talked to lots of people who are mm -hmm. researchers and talked to lots of teachers. Um, not something that I claim to know from my personal research because my research has really mostly been in mathematics. Um, and I'm also just going to tell you that I've never been a fan of acceleration. I think this connects with the story I just told. Um, unless, unless it's clearly there's a thirst for it on the part of the learner. Um, and if that thirst is coming from somewhere else, then I think it's, it's risky. Uh, and I would always advise people before thinking about acceleration to think about going deeper. If you have a kid who's really thriving in the classroom, seems to be mastering things very quickly, there are two ways you can go. You can just move them faster through the material, but you can give them harder problems on the grade level material that they're working with uh, to, to sort of quench that thirst they have for something to struggle with and for something to solve. And I guess I would always advise that. That said, our system is set up to incentivize acceleration greatly. And I recognize that. And you know, mm -hmm. parents are trying to make decisions for their kids based on all sorts of considerations, including you know, what college is my kid going to get into? And currently mm -hmm. colleges reward acceleration. So I think the thirst for acceleration is understandable, but I think it's probably important to be clear about why mm -hmm. you're doing it. I love the sentence, to quench the thirst for something to struggle with. Um, I, I like that idea. And I do, we were talking to Deborah Ball yesterday, and I do think this sort of desire to tinker with and solve problems is very human, connected to being human. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And so take us into the discipline of mathematics, because I do think um, we have these paradigms at play that lead us to act in different ways. Um, we've tried to examine the sort of paradigm of learning as linear or sequential, you know, this notion of it's one domino falls and then another. Um, and there's some real risks in um, operating from the wrong paradigm about a discipline. So describe for us how you would, how you see mathematics 
and what that would lead you to think about and how you would work with children to um, support their learning. We don't have to talk about acceleration as much as just like actually what does moving through learning in mathematics look like? Yeah, so I guess I see um, the body of mathematical knowledge as some sort of network with connections. Um, and it's not arranged in a line necessarily. It is a network. Uh, and there are many different directions you can go in at any one point. There are dependencies in that network. There are things that have to happen before other things. But those dependencies don't arrange the material into a straight line. Um, so if you're thinking of an environment where kids are just allowed to explore and you have somebody helping them go from one node to the next in that, in that network, um, they don't have to be all following the same sequence uh, necessarily. That said, you know, as someone who, who works for an organization that is de designing curriculum, um, although mathematics isn't necessarily arranged in a straight line, time is arranged in a straight line, mm -hmm. like one day comes after the next and there's, you can't branch in time. And so when you're making decisions about how to design a curriculum, you're actually making decisions about how to arrange the material in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. And those are complicated and complex decisions because you want to, you, you have to do that just because mm -hmm. time is linear, but you also have to figure out how do I make sure that this connection here on day three is made with something that comes later on day 15. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I design the curriculum to make those connections with prior material, even though I, I, I can't just have everything in the one great network and look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you describe for us a little bit more the nodes? Um, and what you see to be the most important nodes and, and maybe what connection to the standards, if any, you can make around those? Yeah, well, one a glib answer to that question is they spent a whole year figuring out with other people what those nodes were. Yes. And that was the, <laughs> that was the work in writing the standards. Um, and there are more, there's more than one way to do that, obviously. Um, I think uh, the nodes could be ideas, concepts, or procedures. Um, the um, connections between the nodes are when you have two different ideas that turn out to be two different ways of looking at the same thing, or they turn out to be two different interpretations of the same thing, or you might have a concept and a procedure which are related. Um, the concept of uh, the base 10 system being mm -hmm. related to procedures of arithmetic, for example. Mm -hmm. and when I said it was a network, I mean, the nodes are, you can go very, very fine grained or you mm -hmm. can go very, so, so, so if you really want to do it right, it's some sort of hierarchy of networks at ever higher levels, but that's getting into a rather sort of complex way of thinking about it. Um, I think there's a danger just on that point. There's a danger, part of the difficulty of thinking about mathematics curriculum and teaching mathematics is there's a danger going too high level. There's a, like mm -hmm. these sort of big ideas, you know, people want to name the five big ideas of mathematics. That sometimes just gets too, too big, too fuzzy, mm -hmm. too vague, right? Mm -hmm. There's also a danger in getting down too far in the weeds and wanting to list every single little sort of detailed thing that kids should learn. So the complexity of teaching work is balancing those two how, how much detail do I go? How much detail do I give at this stage? Do I allow this concept to remain vague for now, knowing mm -hmm. that later on it'll become clearer as we see more mm -hmm. examples of it? So that's the complex work of teaching and also of designing curriculum, I think. Mm -hmm. And bring into this grade level and the notion of grade level and obviously the standards are... Um, standards serve many purposes, among others, they're sort of a management tool for learning and they're organized by grade level. Um, take us into how you think, um, particularly if you've had sort of two thirds of fourth grade um, and you're coming back into school in the fall, like how, how we even engage with this notion of grade levels. 
So we've been thinking a lot about this um, at Illustrative Mathematics because there are people using our curriculum who are going to face exactly that problem in the fall. Um, and we've been thinking about how to make sure that when kids come back, they're not just, I, I, so I think what we don't want to do, <laughs> what we would advise against is trying to just go back to mm -hmm. one, two thirds of the way through the previous year and start there and cover everything between that point and the end of the current year. And just year. mark why not to do that. Well, you're trying to compress a year and a third into one year, so you're going faster than some kids can handle. I mean, you have to make some decisions about things to leave out, at the very least there. But also, you should look at what happened in the last third of the previous year and figure out, you know, is some of it stuff that is not necessary right now? Um, or maybe it was extremely important, but I'm going to pull it in just in time during the year. Mm -hmm. um, and partly for me, I think there's a sort of social emotional reason mm -hmm. to not do that here, which is kids are going to be coming back fairly, who knows what they're going to be feeling when they mm -hmm. come back to school. You know, I mean, um, they'll certainly probably, so they've, been, they've been doing all sorts of different things during these school closures. And some of them have been grinding away on worksheets and some of them have possibly been not doing much at all. I think you want to give them a sense of normalcy when they come back and say, we're just going to start with grade level material. We're going to start with unit one. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not going to test you and find out all the gaps in your knowledge and make you feel even worse about mm -hmm. learning math than you might already be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular with our curriculum, the grade one, the unit one of every grade is designed to be invitational. Mm -hmm. to the mathematics, not on the major work of the grade. It's an opportunity for teachers to observe where kids are at with low stakes material. So we start with the geometry unit, uh, data unit, not with the sort of hardcore algebra or arithmetic, which is going to be the stuff they're going to be tested on intentionally. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that there's a chance to see their arithmetic skills, but not in the process of some dreadful review of arithmetic mm -hmm. that they all, you know, are missing. And so I think there's careful work to be done. Another reason to not just go back is it's quite possible that there are situations where in the previous grade you did something and then there's a natural, you, you learn to multiply, um, you learn to, uh, you know, multiply a unit fraction by a whole number or, or uh, and then later on in the next grade, you're gonna learn the full blown fraction multiplication. It makes sense to me since they missed that, to actually mm -hmm. weave it into the mm -hmm. fraction multiplication unit at the moment that that unit happens, mm -hmm. rather, and, and to sort of use the coherence of the curriculum to cause this compression um, of ideas rather than just follow the sequence as it was designed. Yeah. When you and it's, it. it's not just the coherence of the curriculum, it's the coherence of the discipline, right? Like, yes. mm hmm yeah. I mean, I think taking advantage of the coherence is important as a way of gaining efficiencies. Um, I think lightening up on some elements of calculational fluency that are important, but maybe not the most important thing right now mm -hmm. for everybody to get right. Um, if they get an understanding of the way the calculations work and they're not quite as fluent as you would have hoped for in a normal fourth grader, mm -hmm. there's time for that fluency to come back in again. Whereas if you focus on drilling them on the fluency and then you decide to give up on the understanding, the conceptual understanding part, I think then you're setting them up for that sort of fragile fluency that kids have when they've just like learned how to do the math but haven't really mm -hmm. understood why it works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would double, I would double down on understanding um, and um, make allowances for the fact that they might not have had as much practice. Mm -hmm. A right. mm -hmm. couple things you've said, I just want to mark double down on understanding, weave in the missed content within the coherence in a sort of just in time way. Um, and then just attention to people's feelings about their own ability to be a math student and not 
um, overreacting in ways that could unintentionally really damage that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's always been the case that you know, there have been some kids in the class who come to the beginning of the grade with unfinished learning from the prior grade. Mm -hmm. The only difference here is, instead of that being some of the kids, that's most or all of mm -hmm. the kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that one thing will happen here is that we think of better ways of dealing with those kids, even in situations where it's just some of them. Because right. there be all sorts of things that I think are misguided, like sort of ganking them out to some unrelated remedial class, which often sort of condemns them forever to being in that group of kids with unfinished learning. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can't yank an entire class out of class because you've still got the entire class. And so maybe- But you could actually by just going back, right? Which is an equally damaging prospect. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. but I think somehow, although it was always a bad idea, when it's the entire class, I just feel like people see it's obviously a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think educators just want to help. And what we're trying to do here is just explore how do we help best. So right, right. what else, um, anything else that definitely doesn't work that you have seen from research or experience? Um, well, I mean, I think, we, I, I, I think um, unthoughtful acceleration or sort of acceleration inappropriate acceleration mm -hmm. but we've already talked about that yeah um i think separating out a group of kids who are um who have unfinished learning and and giving them something unrelated to the curriculum mm -hmm. doesn't work mm -hmm. um I think reverting to, you know, I think there's going to be a temptation and I completely agree with you here. Everybody is just trying to do the best they can for the kids mm -hmm. and there's pressure on them and there's going to be pressure mm -hmm. from all sorts of di directions. Um, and with the best of intentions, I think that pressure might lead people to decide, let's forget about all this conceptual understanding. Let's just teach them all to do the math. We'll just do a sort of, um, you know, hear the procedures, memorize. Hyper procedure, yeah. Hyper procedural curriculum. And I think um, the danger there is that might work in grade four. You might get kids up to speed for the state test in grade four. But that's been the whole problem with the way we teach mathematics in this country for a long time, mm -hmm. which is that it sort of works for a while, but kids who come out of that sort of curriculum have a very fragile. Mm -hmm. knowledge of mathematics and I've seen this as a university professor with kids coming into the first year of college mm -hmm. they've done very well in algebra they're fluent in algebra but it sort of cracks when there's an unconventional problem or when something isn't presented in exactly the way they're used to seeing it presented which that starts to happen when you go into mm -hmm. math classes in college or when you go into physics classes and like the letters aren't all X's and Y's anymore. Mm -hmm. They're sigmas and omegas and whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't sort of seen, if you, if, if you haven't sort of gotten the sense of looking at the structure of algebraic expressions, rather than just looking for like, what do I do with the X? Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by this sort of fragile fluency with algebra. And mm -hmm. so I think that concentrating entirely on fluency will just lead to that problem in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that very much. I was that student and when I started trying to teach seventh graders how to multiply fractions, I realized I didn't know very much about fractions. <laughs> well, multiplication of fractions is hard. It is hard. <laughs> it is. Uh, what a delight to talk with you. Thank you, Bill McCallum. And thank you for being part of Rethinking Intervention. And we look forward to continuing to learn side by side as we work through all of this together. Great. Well, thanks, Emily. It was great talking to you.